Well, with that, I would like to welcome you to El Delirio. And shortly after I started working at SAR, and that was 1998, that was 20 years ago, um, uh, my son, Jonathan, who was then a student at St. Michael's High School, wanted to know what the school did. And I said, well, it's kind of an anthropological think tank. We have fellowships for scholars to write books and dissertations. We sponsor seminars. Uh, we publish the results in SAR Press. We have a fabulous collection of Indian art. We offer Indian artist fellowships. And you'll just love the old estate that it's on. It was built in the 1920s, I told him, by Martha and Elizabeth White, who called it El Delirio, the Madness. And his response, what a perfect name for an anthropology resort. <laughs> and I, I said, Jonathan, it's not a resort. We make people work. Um, our scholars and artists come here to work. But looking at the grounds, the tennis courts, the billiard house, the gazebo, I can see why people might have that impression. So a few years ago, I began working on a history of SAR in conjunction with our centennial, which we celebrated in 2007. And it provided a perfect opportunity to learn more about the White Sisters and their estate, which SAR has occupied since 1973. And the estate intrigued me, especially their home, which was very much in keeping with the Spanish Pueblo revival style, um, which was becoming very popular at this time. And you are now sitting in their living room. But there were some unusual things about it for the time. Um, as revealed on this 1927 map, um, by Gustav Baumann, who was a close friend of the White Sisters. El Delirio also boasted a tennis courts and a swimming pool, said to be the first in Santa Fe, which at the time was a small community, just a little over 7,000 people. Miss Elizabeth, as she was called, was very proper, a real lady. She bought her clothes in New York. I know exactly where she bought them because we have her, her receipts in our archives. And she wore white gloves, which we also have in our archives. But she also loved to dress up in costumes, <laughs> as did her younger sister, Martha, who wrote plays and performed them in their living room, this room, which was designed with that in mind. They hosted fabulous parties. They loved parades and pageants. But they were also philanthropists. They did a lot for our community. During the 1940s, for example, Elizabeth founded the Garcia Street Club for Neighborhood Children, which continues today as a nonprofit preschool. She was deeply concerned about Indian health. And in 1924, Elizabeth White uh, spent an entire summer at her expense doing a survey of trachoma on the Navajo reservation and gave the results to the public health department. During the depression, she anonymously funded public health nurses for the Pueblos. So who were these sisters? Well, Amelia Elizabeth was the oldest and Martha the youngest of three sisters born and raised in New York City. They were the daughters of Horace White, a wealthy newspaper publisher. He published the New York Evening Post, among other things. And upon his death in 1916, they received trust funds and newspaper stocks, which enabled them to live independently. There was also a middle sister, Abby, who would marry and have children. And one of her sons, W. w. Howells, would become an anth anthropologist and serve on our board and also played a really big role in our acquisition of this property. And Martha and Elizabeth, I discovered, were not just, quote, maiden ladies, as they're often referred to. They were also graduates 
of Bryn Mawr College uh, near Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, which I learned was steeped in traditions such as Lantern Night and May Day, in which students parade in costumes, dance, and perform plays, and they still do that um, to this day. I don't know if we have any Bryn Martyrs in the crowd. Well, maybe we could talk afterwards. But customs like this likely contributed to the White Sisters' love of pageantry, which in turn inspired uh, many of their activities in Santa Fe. But Bryn Mawr's influence is greater than that. At the time, the president of the college was M. Carrie Thomas. And her goal was to inspire in her students the hope of doing something splendid to pursue their ambitions rather than dismissing them as inappropriately unfeminine. And at the same time, she encouraged them to focus on women's suffrage and social reform, and also to be physically fit. Hence, we have the swimming pool and tennis courts here. But I also discovered that the White Sisters were part of a group of Bryn Martyrs who came to Santa Fe during the 1920s and they were a force to be reckoned with. <clears throat> they knew each other, they collaborated on projects, they were part of a larger wave of artists, writers, and intellectuals who came to Santa Fe during the 1920s, um, during the post-war period, disillusioned with life in the industrialized East, East and seeking the more authentic life that Santa Fe seemed to offer, only to discover that the traditional cultures and peoples themselves were endangered by the forces they were trying to escape. And Elizabeth and Martha, I should point out, actually were uh, volunteers for the Red Cross in Belgium and France during the war. In fact, most of the Bryn Martyrs were overseas during World War I. Our other Bryn Martyrs um, include Gertrude Ely, uh, class of 1899, Margreta Stewart Dietrich, class of 1903, and Elizabeth Shepley Surgeon, class of 1903. And it was Elizabeth Shepley Surgeon, who was the writer of the group, who described a Bryn Martyr as a woman selflessly and idealistically devoted to improving the welfare of others. None of them had children, with the exception of Magreta Dietrich, um, who was a widow when she moved to Santa Fe. Uh, they were single. And apparently this was not unusual for graduates of women's colleges at the turn of the 20th century a situation that inspired warnings of race suicide as a potential hazard of women's education. <laughs> this followed 19th century medical opinion that, quote, women's education was inadvisable because intellectual activity risked damaging female reproductive capabilities <laughs> where women's energy should be properly directed, and I gather you don't agree with that. <laughs> well, neither did these uh, Bryn Martyrs. In fact, they decided to focus some of their energies on social reform, and they immediately became involved in Indian land claims and other issues threatening Native peoples here. Coming from privileged backgrounds, they had a lot of connections. One of them, you know, when she was upset about something to do with Native rights, you know, would have lunch with Roosevelt. I mean, those kinds of connections we're talking about. But in 1921, New Mexico Senator Holm Burson of Socorro introduced a bill authorizing that title be granted to non-Indian settlers on Pueblo land if they could prove continuous possession for just 10 years. And these Bryn Martyrs, including Elizabeth White, helped found two organizations to fight that bill, the New Mexico Association on Indian Affairs and the Eastern Association on Indian Affairs. Um, and eventually the bill was indeed 
defeated. So how did the White Sisters specifically come to settle in Santa Fe? Well, this is a story I was told when I first started working here in 1998. I was told that in 1923, they were headed to Mount Palomar in a Lincoln touring car to view an eclipse of the sun when they stopped in Santa Fe to get their hair done. <laughs> Fell in love with it and ended up buying hundreds of acres on the east side. And my first um, thought was, talk about impulse buying. <laughs> so I decided to check it out. There was indeed an eclipse that August and they were headed there to view this eclipse. And they did buy land, not hundreds of acres, a small lot. I have no idea where the beauty parlor was. <laughs> but I, dis I discovered that this was not Elizabeth's first trip to Santa Fe. According to the diary I found in our archives, she first visited Santa Fe in 1913 in August of that year, she went to visit a former classmate, Alice Day Johnson, and her husband, Percy, who lived on a ranch uh, part-time uh, near Wagon Mound. And they decided to go to Santa Fe. They took the train to Santa Fe and visited the Palace of the Governors, where the School of American Archaeology and the Museum of New Mexico were housed. And Elizabeth writes, met the wonderful Mr. Nussbaum and Mr. Hodge, who seems the nicest. Um, and she also met Mayan archeologist Sylvanus Morley, which marked the beginning of an, a lifelong and very important uh, friendship. And the following day, accompanied by Morley, Hodge, and Nussbaum, they headed west to explore the ruins and rugged mesas and lava flows and all, and, and Elizabeth writes, all three archeologists, a double star. The group returned to Santa Fe on August 28th, which was her 35th birthday, heavenly country, she wrote. Nicest birthday in 10 years. And this trip planted the seeds because Elizabeth's previous interest had been in English literature and Europe. They were, you know, she was a world traveler among other things. And she became fascinated with archaeology, anthropology, the native peoples of the Southwest, and Santa Fe. So 10 years later, in 1923, they purchased an acre and a half of land containing a small adobe house on Garcia Street. The house is now one of our scholar apartments. And Garcia Street was a very rural dirt road on the southeastern edge of town. In fact, the city land, city line bisected their property. Sheep and goats grazed in the nearby hills. This is what a traffic jam on Garcia Street used to look like. This was very, very different from the posh Upper East Side home in Manhattan where they grew up with a nanny and servants. Martha was 45, uh, Elizabeth was 45, Martha was 42 at the time. And the two sisters shared a lot of the same interests, but Martha was the really outgoing one. She loved dramatics, she was an avid, avid horsewoman, and she towered over Elizabeth, who barely topped five feet. Elizabeth was more reserved. She preferred music, art, and gardening. But both agreed um, that Santa Fe would be their primary home, even though they still owned a home in New York and eventually would have an estate in Florida as well. So in keeping with Santa Fe style architecture, they hired William Penhallow Henderson to design a home to resemble the Mission Church at Laguna Pueblo. And they began construction in 1926. So what you're witnessing is the construction of this building that you are now in. Yes, yes he did. 
In fact, um, what they've, they believed is that the money that he got from building this house used to build his house. So they called their estate El Delirio after a bar in Seville, Spain. As Elizabeth explained, we were staying in a hotel next to this bar and while sightseeing, we kept getting lost. When we found El Delirio, we knew we were home and I suspect they probably went into El Delirio. <laughs> that same year, this is 1926, they built a swimming pool and hosted one of their first parties uh, to dedicate this pool. Poet Witter Binner <laughs> wrote the script for the ceremonial sacrifice at the sacred well, a mock Mayan ceremony in, wing, in which King Chak dedicated the ceremonial pool to the great feathered serpent with the white sisters playing the part of the two sacrificial virgins, flower of day and flower of night. <laughs> and the pool became a favorite gathering place. Our reception center now occupies the site where the pool uh, once was, but if you go into the reception center, um, you can still see the changing rooms. They're now bathrooms and closets. And animals were a key part of life in El Delirio. They had a stable of saddle horses and pack mules um, for use by their guests and themselves. Both of them rode, but Martha was the horsewoman. She competed in shows, and she had half interest in a ranch near Coolidge, Arizona, where she kept a stable of thoroughbred horses. When the White Sisters were still living in New York, they went to the Westminster Dog Show, and they fell in love with the Irish Wolfhound, which was just being exhibited again in the United States. And they decided if they ever had a big enough place, they would raise them. And so El Delirio definitely afforded this opportunity because they gradually expanded this state where we are right now to include about eight and a half acres. So in 1930, they bought a breeding pair of Irish wolfhounds, Gellert and Edain of Ambleside, and commissioned Olive Rush to paint their portrait. And the first litter was born on February 28th, 1931, and it was absolutely a momentous occasion, they built a state-of-the-art kennel, which they named Rathmullen after a castle in Ireland. The dogs didn't have pens, they had rooms. Each dog had to have a room, um, I mean, had, each, each dog had to have a roommate, and the rooms had Vegas, it was very, very Santa Fe. <laughs> and there were five rooms for the dogs. Um, plus, they had a puppy room and a trophy room. I guess they assumed they were going to do very well, and, and they did. Um, in 1932, they hired Alex Scott, a nationally known collie expert, to train and show their, their dogs. Um, Scott had, I don't know if you remember the books, the, the uh, collie books by Albert Payson Terhune. Um, while Scott had sold Albert Payson Terhune, author of those books, his first show dog, he was from Scotland, uh, Alex Scott was, and he had, advised, he had advised him on his stories. Well, Scott quickly got up to speed on the Irish wolfhound. And soon Rathmullen was considered one of the finest kennels in the country. And then I think it was the kennel master kind of talked uh, Elizabeth into Afghans. And so she, she began raising Afghans. And she called this kennel, kennel the Kandahar Kennel. And 
And so she began the be she became the primary African breeder, and Martha was the one now doing the Irish Wolfhounds. And according to the uh, the complete African Hound. Um, it st it, this book states undoubtedly the most successful Afghan of the 1930s was Amanula of Kandahar, who picked off groups and best in shows like Bones from a Plate. <laughs> and by 1940, Amanula had amassed nine best in shows. And if you do ever get to the SAR library, there is a portrait of Amanula in there. The sisters um, marched with their dogs. They rode their horses in the annual Santa Fe Fiesta Parade, which also provided a venue for them to vent their political views. In 1926, um, in 1926, when the Southwest Federation of Women's Clubs decided to establish a culture center in Santa Fe, the Bryn Martyrs and their artist friends sprang into action lest the city vanish before this swarm of locusts. I mean, these were just kind of educated women from Texas and Oklahoma, but anyway, they referred to them as a swarm of locusts. It was going to be a summer retreat with art and music classes, you know, kind of an adult education place. But fellow Bryn Martyr Margreta Dietrich expressed her disapproval th through this fiesta float. And overnight, the protesters, who included the White Sisters, formed the old Santa Fe Association. I'm sure you're familiar with that, but that's when that started. Uh, dedicated to guiding new growth in such a way as to sacrifice as little as possible of the unique charm and distinction of the city. You know, everyone wants to close the door after them, and I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. But puzzled by the uproar, the genteel ladies from Texas and Oklahoma abandoned their plans. But balancing their community act, they balanced their community activism with parties and they hosted some of the city's most memorable events during this time. In 1982, their friends flocked to see the performance of El Valle de la Rifa, which is a play written by Martha White, and performed here in their living room. And set in Andalusia, Spain, the cast included Witter Binner, William Penn Hollow Henderson, Will Schuster, John Gaumim, and of course, the White Sisters. And I actually paid a visit to Bryn Mawr. I went through their yearbooks, and, and uh, Martha White, I think, performed in every single play they had at Bryn Mawr, and so that, that was her thing. During the 1920s and early 30s, they did not serve alcohol. I mean, it, it was illegal. But as their guests would say as they pulled out their flasks, prohibition is certainly better than no alcohol at all. <laughs> and then on August 30th, 1935, several hundred guests attended a magnificent fiesta party in this room, calling it the most original party of the fiesta season the Santa Fe New Mexican went on to describe Will Schuster's professional flea act. Artist John Sloan's uproarious pantomime of riding in a bus on Fifth Avenue in New York. And Jane Bauman's rendition of She's Only a Bird in a Gilded Cage. And the event concluded with guests singing Rolling Home. But their fellow Bryn Martyrs also gave parties. In fact, the idea of forming an organization to collect and promote Indian art started at a dinner party hosted by fellow Bryn Martyr Elizabeth Shepley Surgent. In 1922, 
Elsie, as she was called, um, was hosting a dinner party at her house in Tsuki. And during the course of the evening, somebody accidentally broke an old Zuni pot. And recognizing its beauty and historic value, the guests rushed to save it from a servant who was about to throw it um, into the Tsuki River. And dis disturbed by the decline of a once vibrant tradition, they vowed they would revive this art form from extinction by systematically collecting Pueblo pottery. And so the Pueblo Pottery Fund was formed. In 1925, they officially incorporated as the Indian Arts Fund, collecting more broadly than just pottery, but again, a focus on New Mexico and the Southwest. Its mission was not only to preserve art, but also to inspire Native people to revive and continue their traditions. All five Bryn Martyrs were founding members, including the White Sisters, and Elizabeth was a major uh, contributor. They accumulated thousands of pieces of art, Indian art, initially stored in somebody's living room. It went to the basement of the Fine Arts Museum, then to the basement of the Laboratory of Anthropology, back to the basement of the Fine Arts Museum. And then in 1954, the trustees approached SAR and they said, we don't want this collection to come under state control. And they deeded the collection to us, which at that time numbered some 4,500 pieces with the understanding we would eventually have a place to house this collection. It took a while. Um, our first vault was built in 90, 1978, and I hope all of you will have an opportunity to see that collection at some point. But the other thing Elizabeth was really passionate about, she wanted to create a national market for Indian paintings and pottery and textiles produced specifically by Navajo and Pueblo peoples. And she opened her own Indian arts and crafts sh store in New York City, which she called Ishuhu. And she showed the works, work of San Ildefonso's, uh, San Ildefonso artists such as Awatsira and Okwapi. But the shop was not terribly successful. I mean, the, People of New York really didn't have an appreciation or really understanding of, of this art. So she decided in 1931 to address that issue that she would host an exposition of Indian tribal arts at Grand Central Galleries in New York. And she invited these and other Indian artists to demonstrate their art. And her goal was to have their work recognized not as ethnographic specimens of scientific curiosity, but as fine art. And what she said, quote, the objects produced in an aesthetic tradition of Indian life, she explained, are imbued with a spirit not found in modern contemporary art. And she hoped to create a national market for this work. Uh, she, she was concerned about their survival. And she thought, this can help. This is a way um, for them to be economically viable. And the White Sisters were also very concerned about this preservation of Santa Fe's unique architecture, uh, our, um, culture, and, and especially its architecture. And of course, they built their house in the Spanish Pueblo Revival style. But that, they thought, is, is not enough. So in 1924, they formed a real estate company, the De Vargas Development Corporation, for the purpose of acquiring land and shepherding development to conform to the Spanish Pueblo revival style. And they did own hundreds of acres on the east side 
um, all the way from Garcia Street up to Camino del Monte Sol to Museum Hill. They subdivided into lots and people that bought houses had to conform to that, that style. And then in 1927, the White Sisters purchased an old 33-room hacienda from the heirs of Jose Sena. And again, they hired their architect, William Penhallow Henderson, to renovate the structure. Another wing was added and a second floor constructed on the east wing. And they opened the Sena Plaza restaurant in the old stables where La Casa Sena restaurant is, is today. And they offered lunch, dinner, and afternoon tea because Elizabeth said there's no good place for a woman to have tea in Santa Fe. So here it was, and it operated for a couple of years. But they were very generous. Um, the De Vargas Development Corporation, um, which they owned, donated land for the Laboratory of Anthropology in 1927 and also for the Museum of Navajo Ceremonial Art, or the Wheelwright Museum, as it's called today. And of course, that property that they donated now houses the Folk Art Museum um, and Museum of Indian Art and Culture. That was all land that they gave up on uh, Museum Hill. The Laboratory of Anthropology later donated about eight and a half acres of that land to the National Park Service, which in 1939 built the largest adobe office building in the United States, and I'm sure a number of you have seen that. Well, such was life here at El Delirio. It was good until 1937, when Martha, age 57, died of cancer. Elizabeth went into a deep and prolonged mourning. She stopped giving parties. She sold off all of the Irish wolfhounds, which had been Martha's breed. She also donated their fabulous collection of Indian art because they collected Indian art as well. They gave, she gave away 1,350 pieces of art to museums and schools across the country. And she kept only a few treasured pieces, such as this mural by Awat Sira, which we found rolled up in her garage when we moved into this property. This is usually displayed on the wall here but it's now on exhibit at the New Mexico Museum of Art as part of their centennial exhibition. And when that ends uh, at the end of this month, it will come back here. In 1939, she gave Santa Fe its first animal shelter in memory of Martha. And next year, the animal shelter will celebrate its 80th anniversary. Uh, two years later, in 1941, she converted one of her houses into the Martha White Memorial Art Gallery, um, in, in part to help her artist friends. Um, but also, what she decided to do is she would have shows. She would charge a nickel admission. She would use a portion of the proceeds from sales to help fund the animal shelter. But the timing of this, um, this um, gallery uh, didn't work exactly for that pur purpose. The gallery opened on December 8th. So what happened the day before that? The bombing of Pearl Harbor. And so she decided instead, she would do this, she would do, have shows, but she would donate the money for the war effort, and particularly for the USO. And so 19 one-person shows followed, um, beginning with the work of their architect, William Penhallow Henderson. And you'll recognize 
you'll recognize all of these names. This would have been the time to buy art. Too bad you weren't there then. Because they were selling this you know, for $50, $100, maybe $200 for a John Sloan. But those, those, the, the people who were showing uh, included Gustav Bauman, Joseph Bacos, Sheldon Parsons, Will Schuster, uh, Theodore Van Soen, Randall Davey, Alfred Morang, Raymond Johnson, and there were five women artists also included in, this, in these one, women, uh, one, one person shows. Dorothy Stewart, Olive Rush, Eugenie Chenard, Pansy Stockton, and Gina Nee. And Gina Nee had the last show October 19th through 9, November 1st, 1942. And then they were going to shut down until May, but they never reopened. And you can see the work of Gina Nee. It's currently on exhibit as part of the Five Artists Community Show at the, at the Art uh, Museum. Then in October 1942, just as this gallery is having its last show, Elizabeth becomes ill with some kind of thyroid disorder. And she hires a nurse, Catherine Rain. The two hit it off. Elizabeth recovers. And Catherine ends up being her live-in companion for the rest of Elizabeth's life. And life at El Delirio resumes. The parties continue. In 1942, and she became regional director of Dogs for Defense. Shortly after the United States entered World War II, the Army decided to implement a war dog program. It's the first time in our military history we wanted to do this. Germany, other countries had done it for years. And so, but the problem was it didn't have any dogs. And so um, it partnered with a nonprofit called Dogs for Defense. And Dogs for Defense said, I'll tell you what, it said this to the Army, will recruit people's pets. You train them to be war dogs. And Elizabeth White at the time was, the, was head of the New Mexico Kennel Club, which, which is probably why she was tapped for being director for New Mexico. And so in the, in the months, the years that followed, some 85 dogs, pets, from around New Mexico came here on site to El Delirio for their preliminary screening. And those that passed um, then went to one of the Army remount centers, um, such as Front Royal, Virginia, or Fort Robinson, Nebraska, for more um, detailed training uh, as sentry dogs initially. And from there, if they passed, they um, went overseas to the war effort. But not all dogs appreciated the patriotic gestures of their owners. Several days after he arrived, Eric, a collie from Albuquerque, jumped the fence and was hot-footing at home. A local newspaper reported that, quote, his owner, Lawrence Stevens, had started a dog watch on US Highway 85 when advised that Eric, apparently weary of drill and lack of canine USO facilities, <laughs> had broken away. After traveling some 30 miles, Eric was finally spotted at Santo Domingo Pueblo. The deserter was finally caught <laughs> and returned to the training grounds where it is believed he will be content to nurse his sore feet and then get into the spirit of the Army War Dog program. <laughs> and you know, by golly, he did. <laughs> he passed and he ended up in Front Royal, Virginia. But this, his escape made national news. And it, you know, it was in the New York Times. Everyone was rooting for him to get away. <laughs> then, um, the war ended and the parties resumed. In 1949, Elizabeth hosted a ball in honor of the 18th century Italian painter Pietro Longi. 
Gustav and Ann Baum, and we're among the many notable guests who attended this very festive event. Then that same year, Elizabeth actually hired John Gaumin to design a memorial gazebo as a resting place for Martha's ashes and had it built near the cemetery of their beloved dogs. The front was decorated with a bust of Martha made by Francois Tinetti originally for the New York Public Library and installed over an entryway. In 1903, Martha had posed for Athena, one of the three classical reliefs there at the library, and obtaining a copy, Elizabeth had it recast in stone and set in the wall of the gazebo. So next time you're in New York, go look for it. It's above one of the entrances. Then during the 1940s, Elizabeth finally became involved with uh, the School of American Research, with SAR. Um, she, like many people, had clashed with its founding director, Edgar Lee Hewitt, who everyone, who they referred to as El Toro for, I guess, <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, but after Hewitt's death in 1946, uh, her friend Sylvanus Morley, who she met on that first trip out here back in 1913, was named director. And he invited her to join the school's board of managers in 1947, and she readily accepted. When Doug Schwartz became president of SAR in 1967, she was nearly 90 and still involved in the school. In fact, in 1962, she had donated the old kennel building to SAR for use as an archaeology lab. Her last dog, Loppy, she had put down in 1960, so she didn't have any dogs anymore. When her kennel master died, she pretty much just allowed the dogs to live out their life on the property, so that was over. And she had begun to donate property. In 1966, she donated adjoining land to this, to this estate here to the city for a Korean War Memorial. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Amelia Elizabeth White Park, which is right next door to us. And at the suggestion of several board members, Doug began calling on Elizabeth for afternoon chats and martinis in her living room, and I guess she, she held the martinis pretty well, but he, oh, well, I'm not gonna go into that. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was successful. They, f they formed a really uh, a deep and warm friendship um, over those years. And when Elizabeth White died on August 28th, 1972, it was her 94th birthday um, she left her estate to SAR. A gift that has become part of the re remarkable legacy of two sisters who as good Rin martyrs came to Santa Fe in the 1920s with an agenda to do good, to be strong, and to party on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>